Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg. I'm so happy to be speaking today with my long-term friend and colleague, Guy Armstrong. Guy's practiced insight meditation for over 40 years, including training for a while as a Buddhist monk in Thailand with Ajahn Buddhadasa. He began teaching in 1984 and has led retreats worldwide. Guy's a guiding teacher at the Insight Meditation Society, where he works with three-month retreatants, as well as offering online courses of his teachings. Guy is the author of Emptiness, a Practical Guide for Meditators, released in 2017 by Wisdom Publications, and also is a regular contributor to Lions Roar Magazine and Tricycle Magazine. Welcome, Guy. Hey, Sharon. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I was thinking when we knew we were going to be talking today, when did you and I last get a chance to sit down and just talk about meditation for an hour together? I know. Like, maybe never. We This <laughs> guy, I should say, is... Uh, stellar member of the Guiding Teachers Council and Board of Directors at IMS, and uh, I depend on him tremendously for clarity and organization, and um, can't bear the thought of him not being there. <laughs> so <laughs> let's not and go we, there. <laughs> and we depend totally on Sharon for attending about 18 different committee meetings <laughs> and keeping the board on track. It's a good good combination. So when did we first meet, you and I? Well, I'm not sure how much contact we had, but the first retreat I sat was with you and Joseph and Jack in New Mexico in 1976. Oh. <laughs> so it goes back away. And then, you know, I came for a long retreat at IMS in 77 and then came on staff in 78. Mm -hmm. So back, definitely back in that era. And those are, I was laughing because I just saw... Uh, another old friend, Jean Ann Whittington, who oh, yeah. uh, I think maybe was at that very same retreat, and she reminded me that I used to do interviews, which are these uh, brief personal meetings with, with retreatants, uh, first thing in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning or something like that. <laughs> and I am so not a morning person that she, I, I just used to kind of sit there, like, <laughs> blankly, and I said, yeah, that's about right, so... It must have come out of that old Asian tradition where we were getting up at four in the morning. That's correct. Sitting. That really, really difficult tradition. <laughs> so you began teaching in 1984, which, of course, is the year that we brought uh, Saito Upandita to the Insight Meditation Society. Was it after that that you began teaching? Well, actually, I was in England when I started teaching. I okay. started teaching, really, okay. in the Sharpum community and then at Gaia House, so... I actually missed Saidao's visit in 1984, uh -huh, uh -huh. but I heard a lot about it. And then I was teaching in England till about 88, and then I came back into the States. Mm -hmm. Now That's right. It's all coming back to me now. <laughs> um, and when was the last time you sat uh, a long retreat? Well, I sat um, a six-week retreat at IMS. I think it was 2015, I had a sabbatical mm -hmm. period, and I sat six weeks at the retreat center, and then the next year I sat a month at the forest refuge. Those count. <laughs> those definitely count. Yeah. yeah. So those are, those are the most recent ones. But I, you know, I like dropping back into that yogi space from time to time to remind me of what people are going through when I'm, I'm with people who are sitting for three months. Mm -hmm. it puts me in touch with the reality of, you know, a lot of hours on the cushion and some loneliness and not going out for your own food. Mm -hmm. And the joy, the indescribable joy. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a lot of bliss, too. Yeah. So what first brought you to meditation? Well, I was um, just thinking about that the other day, and it was kind of interesting. I grew up in the middle of the country. I grew up in a suburb of St. Louis, you know, very sort of ordinary childhood but when I was 16, I was poking through a bookstore, and I came upon this book with a picture of the Buddha on the cover, a statue of the Buddha. And so I bought it, and it was The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. I, did you ever come across that? Yeah, sure. Days? Yeah. Probably the same yeah. age, actually. Uh-huh. 
And so I didn't read it then, but I took it to college with me. And once I got into college, I got kind of interested in philosophy and religion. And I started reading that, and I felt like there was a whole world that was unknown and really interesting in in Buddhism. But Alan Watts and the other guy I read was D.T. Suzuki. They never told you to meditate. Mm. You know, so I thought you could get it all from reading. And then finally, in the early 70s, I was living in Palo Alto. I went to a yoga class, and the teacher was offering Vipassana instructions. So I really I went for the yoga, but I stayed for the Vipassana. And then uh, in 76 is when I discovered your retreat in New Mexico and came for that, and I got totally hooked. Mm. That's great. So Vipassana is a word in Pali, which is the language of the original Buddhist text, and it means insight. Um, and one of the uh, ways one develops insight through mindfulness, which is actually its original and uh, most important goal in the classical sense, um, is through understanding what are called the three characteristics of life. And un- by understanding, I mean direct seeing and, and deepening awareness of. So it's a very kind of embodied understanding. Uh, and these three characteristics are known as uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and emptiness or or egolessness. And, um, you know, there are many ways, there are many reasons we practice mindfulness. Uh, these days, a lot of people practice just to have a better life and, you know, more connection, more intimacy with the experiences of their life. Originally, that was that was great, and more um, directly to the core understanding was the idea of insight, that we practice not just to inhabit our lives more fully, we practice to truly understand our lives and, and the nature of who we are and who we're not, and birth and death, and uh, what brings us happiness and what brings us suffering and so on. So of those three characteristics, impermanence, suffering or unsatisfactoriness and emptiness, um, Guy has written his book, which is, you know, uh, I would say a long time coming. That's what people said about loving kindness for me. Exactly. Um, on emptiness, which I'm so happy about. So uh, how is it a practical guide? Well, I think emptiness is a really um, practical uh concept, although it takes a while to understand what makes it work. The idea of emptiness, you know, sketched very, very briefly, is that the world is not as solid as we think it is, Mm -hmm. and we as humans are not as fixed Mm -hmm. as we think, we tend to think that we are. And so once we start getting into the direct experience of ourselves and of the things we, we find in life, we find they're characterized, as you said, by you know impermanence. None of them last long enough to be really satisfying. And there's this interesting kind of mystery that in the center of it all is not a solid entity that we would call me or self, but it more opens into space. Mm-hmm. So emptiness, as we start looking into it, opens into this feeling you know, that we first probably contact in meditation that really our experience is made up of a lot of space. You know, you can see this in the outside world. You look out a window and things are are there, but there's mostly space. And you start to look internally, and yeah, there are body sensations and thoughts and moods and everything, but there's a lot of inner space too. So as we start to open up into that inner space, um, I think you you use the concept of emptiness really opens us up into being more grounded. Mm-hmm. And I think of how the opening to space uh, leads us into relaxation and ease and settledness. So I think if we can find avenues into feeling the extent of space that's in our experience, it really leads to a settling of our whole our whole being. Well, space is something that. Um... It's like a relief, actually. Mm, yeah. You know, sometimes I talk about, uh, in my own experience, sitting and looking at my own fear. And by mindful, you know, we also talk about looking at or seeing what we're looking at in a certain way, you know, not holding on, not pushing it away, not trying to explain it, 
not trying to make it go somewhere else, you know, but just being with. <clears throat> so in being with my own fear in that way, I realized that unlike the world's pronouncement, like we're afraid of the unknown, of course I can be afraid of the unknown too, but I'm largely afraid when I think I do know and it's going to be really bad. And there are lots of stories that I'm telling myself, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And, and then when I remind myself I don't know, I feel space. And in that space, which is a kind of emptiness, I don't, I don't have that sense of dread, you know, because I don't know. And, and it's like many things are possible and I don't know what's going to happen. And there is a kind of mystery and it's such a relief to be in that place because it's also true. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's beautifully said. And one of the things that we find when we come into the moment is that things as they are in the moment are mostly bearable. You know, even a, an emotion like fear, which is one of the hardest things, I think, for people to bear, if you're not in a physically threatening situation at that moment and you can allow yourself just to feel what the feeling of fear is, it's not, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't even have to be threatening. And so that very openness and acceptance of it creates a lot of space around it. And we find the present moment isn't as scary as all the stories we make up. And so it kind of gets, it kind of gets into this interesting exploration of, well, why are we telling ourselves all these scary stories or, or wanting stories or sad stories? And I think one of the interesting things about coming into meditation is we start to see what the mind is doing most of the time that we normally don't pay attention to because we're doing something else. But when we just become... Uh, still with our body and look inward, we start to see, oh, there's a really strong habit of thinking, mostly about past and future, and that fills us with fear on the one hand or sadness or wanting on the other hand, and it's all that activity that keeps us feeling stirred up. And so when we can put some, some space around that, it really helps to let those thoughts and emotions settle down. So of those three characteristics of impermanence and unsatisfactoriness and, and emptiness, let's take them one by one. So um, impermanence. Um, there are times in practice where it seems that uh, we see the glorious side of impermanence. Everything's arising, it's beginning, and it feels really good. There are other times in practice and as in life, that we see how everything's fleeting and it's moving and we can't hold on to anything, and that brings a very different kind of felt sense. So would you like to comment on that? Hmm. No, it's a really good point. Impermanence does go in both directions. Um, and impermanence and emptiness are, are pretty closely related because they're both pointing to the fact that there's nothing fixed in our experience, either of the outer world or of our inner life. And this self that we sometimes think is at the center, we tend to think of it as a kind of fixed eye in the middle that's experiencing all the changing events and phenomena of life. But when we look closely, there's nothing in our whole experience that isn't subject to the law of impermanence in its beautiful aspects and its, and its difficult aspects. So we, you know, we kind of, as we look for this thing called I, but all we find is change, we kind of realize, well, the real meaning of impermanence is that there isn't any lasting self at the center of it all. So in that way, the impermanence and the emptiness of self really, really go hand in hand. And impermanence is a hard thing to take in and really open to just because of, of what you said, Sharon. It has a beautiful side and it has a difficult side. We want some things to stay the same, mm -hmm. and we want other things to go away even quicker. Um, but obviously, we can't we can't control that. And so, in examining where suffering comes from, which is the third characteristic characteristic that you pointed to, we start to see that well, impermanence isn't necessarily bad in itself, but it becomes painful if we're holding on mm -hmm. to something beautiful that we want to stay the same or we're trying to keep away something unpleasant that we don't want to experience. So in that way, all those three characteristics really tie together, and you could say the hinge is impermanence. So the, the, um, 
words that Guy just translated as suffering, which is the classical translation, is in Pali again. Pali um, is is dukkha, d u k k h a, and it's kind of a hard word to translate. I also use suffering uh, because that's what I was taught, you know, a million years ago when I went to India, and it's what I'm used to describing it as. It's a little bit too grim a word for some people. Um, and it encompasses more than just, you know, having an injury or a heartbreak or something that's clearly painful. It's the insecurity, the unsteadiness of life. It's the contingent nature of life, too, has a a flavor seen from one angle of um, unsatisfactoriness. It's like nothing happens just because we desire it. All the conditions have to come together for something to arise. So a kind of poignant example of that would be having a friend whom you love, whom you care about, who's having a terrible time. Um, and you can't just say, poof, your suffering's gone. You know, all these conditions, including within them, mostly within them, need to come together for a change in course or a change in behavior. And so there's a poignancy to that. It's not like overt, gross, terrible suffering, but it kind of hurts too. So um, I was just taken, Guy, when you use the word suffering, because I do. And these days people might say stress or other things, which I'm sure are fine translations, but uh, not not the one I would tend to gravitate toward. Yeah. Um, you know, just as you say, I think the most comprehensive translation of that word dukkha is unsatisfactoriness, because mm-hmm. it runs the whole spectrum and... Uh, that covers the whole range, but sometimes you know it's just the truth of life mm-hmm. that the unsatisfactoriness shows up as direct suffering, which actually the Buddha termed dukkha dukkha, right. you know, suffering unsatisfactoriness, or like a double shot of espresso or something. So sometimes life just is like that, and actually that that examination of where the unsatisfactory feeling comes from. I think is a really important and central point in meditation. Mm -hmm. When we're in meditation, we don't want to just go off into some pleasant cloud-like state. We really want to see how our whole experience is showing up moment by moment. And when we get into places where there's pain, there's hurt, there's friction, there's disappointment, whatever the nature of it, we kind of want to look at that closely because those are the things that are making the difficulties for us in life. So one of the key examinations is to ask the question, where is the, where is the actual rub, the friction, the suffering piece coming from? And the classical Buddhist answer is that it's coming because we're holding on. Mm-hmm. And by holding on, we're at, um, odds with the nature of reality because nothing's going to stay. You know? Exactly, exactly. So again, we come up against the truth, the truth of impermanence, and it's kind of the ignoring of the truth of impermanence that leads us into positions of unhappiness. Mm-hmm. But this ignoring is not just an intellectual thing, you know, that we're going to decide once and that's going to be it. But it has to be a moment by moment kind of continual examination of am I creating suffering in this moment or am I creating the grounds for future unhappiness through this tendency to hold on, which itself is fueled by some fear and insecurity. Yeah, they say that, of of course, as you've been saying so so well, the three characteristics of impermanence and, say, dukkha and... Uh, Emptiness are very closely aligned, and one leads into another. If you deeply understand one, uh, you you are led right into the others. Even what I just said about um, the contingent nature of life, from one angle it's suffering, from another angle it's emptiness, you know, that there is no core, that everything is conditions coming together. So uh, I'd also remember when I was first in India, which was in the early 70s, uh, and and studying, and they would say in terms of these three characteristics, sometimes people would have a particular tendency, I don't know if it was based on personality or what, but they'd have a, a particular tendency toward one rather than the others, and that became their doorway into then understanding 
the other two and, and becoming free. And so I would say looking at myself, the thing that struck me, you know, most graphically was suffering, no surprise. And um, the uh, emphasis in the early teachings that I had was impermanence and emptiness was like a complete mystery to me at first. And I used to sit there and think, what are they talking about? And this is in contrast to uh, a mutual friend of ours, Fred von Altman, who's a Swiss teacher, um, whom I met back in 1970. And he told me that when he first heard about emptiness, he so deeply knew it was true. He said, like, it's like the hairs on his body stood up. And I confessed to him, I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> so what about you, Guy? <laughs> well, I think I definitely came into practice through the unhappiness in my life at the time. I kind of emerged from the 60s, uh, uh, kind of carrying the remnants of overdoses of all the things that were going on in the late 60s in the culture that I was into. And I came out with a lot of confusion and um, looking for some kind of clarity and peace. So I wandered into meditation out of suffering. And as I settled into it, you know, I knew I needed to deal with that moment after moment after moment. But then I'd listen to these Dharma talks on the topic of, of emptiness or selflessness, as we might call it. And they really, they really interested me intellectually. And I also had some kind of faith that 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 was that that was true. I remember coming out of my first retreat, the one with you in New Mexico, mm -hmm. and I came back to California where I was living at the time, and I talked to some friends who kind of couldn't understand why I would go into silence mm -hmm. and put up with eight hours of silent sitting a day um, for anything. And I said, you know what I found on that cushion that week is that there's so much space in the mind that anything that isn't working right I can eventually figure out a way to be free of it. Mm. I just gained, you know, that that confidence from that very first retreat, and it really was kind of about the the, the amount of openness that was in the mind had the capacity to settle or understand whatever unhappiness was there. So it didn't feel so totally foreign to you this idea of emptiness. The sense of unfixedness, it sounds like it struck you as. Yeah, that there was nothing in my whole experience that was fixed and had to continue the way that it was, mm -hmm. which meant that my unhappiness wasn't fixed. Mm -hmm. Whatever got built up there could also be uh, taken down, like moving furniture into a mm -hmm. room. You know, it's kind of like, okay, the first time you move into a new apartment, everything's empty, and then you bring in the furniture piece by piece, whatever piece of furniture we brought in can also be taken out. Well, I think largely, you know, whatever conditioning we've grown up with, it all came in piece by piece, and whatever has been done and planted there can also be uh, removed, and it's really through the capacity for spaciousness and emptiness that we come to know that. In your book, you talk a lot about the six senses. And first of all, you probably have to explain what the sixth one is. And I'm um, curious about the relationship to that kind of immediate experience we have and the truth of emptiness. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Buddha talked a lot about the six senses. And, of course, we're all familiar with the five physical senses of sight and sound and smell and taste and touch. Well, the Buddha talked about there being a sixth sense, which is the mind, and the objects of the mind are basically our thoughts and our feelings. So in Buddhist meditation, thoughts and feelings are taken up as just another sense object, just like sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch are. And the wonderful thing about the quality of mindfulness is that it has, it has this ability to pay attention to those mental experiences in exactly the same way as we can pay attention to physical experiences, sight, sound, etc. You know, when I came into meditation, I was so wrapped up in the world of thinking that I didn't think it was possible to step out of it. But mindfulness is outside of the thought process and can observe thoughts just like it observes a sound or a breath. 
So it gives an incredible power when the workings of the mind themselves can be observed just like other sense phenomena. So the, I think the implication for meditators is we spend a lot of our time thinking of our life as happening you know, with these concepts of the past. What's happening to my career or family or the past? How did I get into the situation? Where does all this sadness come from? But what's so radical about mindfulness practice is it's only about the present moment and seeing, well, what's creating the suffering or the peace or the ease right now. And in that way, the, the clearest thing I think we can look at are these elements of the six senses. And when we start to look at our experience moment to moment in that way, none of them are overwhelming. They're all workable, and we can settle with anything that presents itself in those six senses in the moment, as long as the moment itself isn't uh, overwhelming or, or traumatizing. Speaking of trauma, when I when I first heard, I think one of my problems with the word emptiness or the concept of emptiness in the beginning was that it represented, in my mind, a kind of annihilation, you know, that there was an ego within me or, you know, other forms, selflessness or egolessness. There was an ego within me that had been my companion somehow throughout my life, and I was now going to kill it for spiritual, you know, upliftment or something. Mm -hmm. And it was terrifying to me. I thought it was like a secret death and I couldn't see why anyone would want it. And of course, it's it's very different than that. And I was very uh, much reassured upon studying more of what the Buddha taught and realizing that it, it wasn't a question of plunging into a void or, or nihilism, that it was more a question of um, seeing that a lot of the ways I had viewed myself and issues of connection and so on were were misconstrued. They were based on ignorance and that what I was finding was not my secret little self. It was ignorance. Mm. I think that's really nicely put. I mean, emptiness is kind of an off-putting word. Yeah. When, when you think of what you're going to draw people to meditation practice by talking about emptiness, right. I don't think so. Um, and I think a lot of people have the connotations um, not just of ego death, but of yeah, coming into something that is vacant, really absent, um, uh, that there's a loss of meaning and it's connected with some kind of despair. Mm -hmm. And just as you said, that that isn't the way that it feels when we actually start to sense what is being pointed to. What's being pointed to is this absence of fixedness. It's empty of anything that's fixed or solid. Mm -hmm. And what that opens us to is this, number one, a great sense of space, openness, um, freedom, you know, kind of freedom to move around. And also, as you, just as you get more into the moment and out of the stories about past and future, it opens to the great beauty of um, what we're witnessing. Obviously, when we first come into practice, there there often is, you know, a lot of emotional conditioning to open to and come to understand and and work through, but it also opens us to the beauty of, of the wonderful qualities of heart and mind, of loving kindness, of compassion, of the wisdom that's uh, possible, the balance of mind, of equilibrium, not to mention the beauty of, of nature and the physical world. So I think all that you know, after we get through the off-putting mm -hmm. parts of the description, all that is what kind of comes out of the openness. It's beautiful. I was having a, a conversation a while ago with a young college student, and uh, he said um, to me at one point, uh, have you ever heard of Nietzsche? And I said, the philosopher? <laughs> He said, yeah, and and I said, from our, like, you know, 45-year uh, age gap or something, um, I said, yeah, of course, but I haven't read him since I was in college, like, like you, and, and he said, well, what do you think about what he said about Buddhism? And I'm not sure if this is this person's own personal reading or, or if it's actually accurate, but I said, what did he say about Buddhism? And uh, the young man said, um, Nietzsche said that 
uh, Buddhism was nihilistic. And I said, well, then he didn't understand Buddhism because yeah. the Buddha made such a point of saying this is not nihilism. But it seems like when you're emphasizing emptiness, you're right on the brink sometimes. Mm-hmm. No, it's a challenging word. And, you know, at first I thought, well, maybe it's a mistranslation. So, you know, I looked into the Pali and nope, it's not a mistranslation. Mm-hmm. It really is the word the Buddha was using. I have a feeling that he intended to be provocative even back then, Mm -hmm. because there was a lot of kind of rich debate going on. But, you know, I don't think it's so bad for a system to have a word that provokes us now and then and makes us sit up and think, Mm -hmm. wow, maybe there's something here that I should look into. And especially, uh, I think, when the teachings on emptiness can be delivered with a warm heart and a little bit of humor and a certain amount of kindness, that, that... manifestation definitely offsets a tendency to think that there's anything nihilistic or despairing Mm -hmm. uh, that's going on. But I do think it kind of needs both. It needs the loving kindness that um, you've written and talked so much about alongside these deep wisdom pointings, which which can be unsettling. So I I also don't want to deny that as people get into the exploration of what emptiness means, they can feel like some of the ground is shifting under underneath their feet mm-hmm. or the carpet's being pulled out from under them because the basic way we hold ourselves, as you just pointed out, has been formed out of mis- some misunderstanding. So we, we do go through a real transformation of the way we understand ourselves and the way we understand other people. And, and that's sometimes unsettling. Well, the other side of the other face of emptiness is interconnection, right? Because mm-hmm. it's not blank, actually. It's not like everything disappears. Everything is here. We are here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what about when we don't see ourselves in the same old way? I think any spiritual path uh, that deals with transformation has this as a central issue to relate to. Uh, some things change as you walk a spiritual path, I think our concepts of what's important Mm -hmm. and what's meaningful and what's good and what's really valuable tend to change as we open up to uh, more understanding. So as our values shift, we may often find, oh, I haven't been living my life in alignment with my new values. Mm -hmm. My life was more based upon the old values And now I'm not so happy about that. So how do I need to clean up my life or how do I need to restructure my relationship so that it really aligns with these values of one, loving kindness, and two, understanding of myself and other people? So I think that's a a challenge that doesn't entirely go away Mm -hmm. for the whole whole of the path that we walk. But I think the positive thing is that at every step of the way, even though there are difficulties, we're also feeling the kind of growth and opening that leads to more um, more coming in of beauty, of connection, as you mentioned, Sharon, of warmth in relationship that sort of says, okay, this is tough, but there are so many good things happening that I know it's the right direction. And we just have to trust that we will work through the difficulties of change in ourselves, the difficulties of change in our relationship, and grow with all the benefits that we're seeing also. So a lot of systems would would probably um, frame this in terms of balance, like we need the wisdom and the ability to let go, that the radical ability to let go that comes from seeing emptiness. And we also need loving kindness and compassion and the recognition that our lives aren't just haphazard, that we're connected, that we live in an interconnected universe. So um, you and I have spent time together both practicing and teaching loving kindness. And uh, it's interesting for me to reflect on its relationship to emptiness. Mm, what strikes you? <laughs> well, I think about um, there's, there's some ancient Tibetan sage, I can't remember which one, uh, who said something, maybe Nagarjuna or maybe Padmasam, somebody said, um, 
uh, pity the person who's attached to material reality because then we're, you know, we're constantly getting hit over the head by change and we think we can hold on successfully and sadly we can't. So pity the person who's attached to material reality, but pity more the person who's attached to emptiness. <laughs> um, because uh, how do you, after someone has gone so uh, extreme in that view, let's say, that loving kindness seems irrelevant and ethics seems meaningless and everything is meaningless, nothing counts, nothing matters. How do you come back to a state of balance? It's kind of hard. Yeah, well, I think that is um, that is a potential risk, and I think that the problem is when people take something like emptiness and turn it into a viewpoint or an opinion or a stance, mm -hmm. and say something like, "Well, everything's empty, so nothing matters," but that's the furthest thing possible from what is intended in the teachings and from what the Buddha intended, and it just has to be seen as. Um, a misunderstanding in its own way. And so it comes back exactly to that question of balance that, that you talked about. Um, I actually think that emptiness and loving kindness really depend on each other mm. and that we can't really deepen in one without deepening well in the other. And uh, the Ooh, way Could you say more? Could you yeah, the, the way I think loving kindness supports emptiness, the seeing of emptiness, is that. Um, as we feel warmer toward ourselves, more accepting of ourselves, more loving of people in general, that brings a deep relaxation into our being. And so we come to feel, okay, I can settle into my present moment experience of life, and it is okay the way it is. And that settling in and relaxing takes some of the control, some of the hand off of the control lever, and that's what, that taking off the control, that relaxation is what opens up space. Ah, oh, I don't have to control everything myself. I don't have to make things happen. Things are happening on their own nature. Well, you mentioned earlier the feeling of relief that comes in. Mm -hmm. Loving kindness brings that kind of space, opens us to relief, and we can settle into letting things unfold as they are without the self trying to control it all. And then on the other side, I think the more we understand there's nothing fixed in us, we don't have to try and struggle and control every bit of our experience. We can let go of some of our obsessive thinking. You know, we spend so much time thinking about past and future, about trying to fix what happened in the past or cement what ought to happen in the future. When we let go of those kind of streams, that you could call it hope and fear, we settle into the present moment, and then out of that relaxation, love and compassion come more easily. It's funny, I was just listening to a Joni Mitchell song mm. the other day, and she has this great line. She says, I love you when I forget about me. Mm, that's a great line. Yeah, and I think it's like that. When we can let go of some of the self-obsession, you know, loving kindness is there. So they both relate, they both support one another. I think so, and I think that you know, I think your teaching really exemplifies what you communicate to students. I believe is growing up wisdom and loving kindness side by side, mm -hmm. so that one doesn't ever get too far out ahead of the other, but we have them both developing uh, nicely in in our practice. It was fascinating talking to you because, um, you know, our backgrounds in so many ways are so similar and our approaches are so similar. And um, I think about the people that uh, you might commonly teach uh, who come to IMS, the Insight Meditation Society, for a long retreat, a three-month retreat. And, and their um, exposure to these teachings is, is very strong because that's what's presented. Uh, in a very non-sectarian and open way, you know. So um, what happens if uh, somebody, you know, doesn't do long-term practice or somebody's sort of, uh, or doesn't do that kind of study or reading and they're more into like the one-minute meditation or uh, as somebody said to me once, um, I was teaching a class and 
in New York, and somebody said, uh, not that charmingly, they said, uh, a lot of younger meditation teachers than you um, <laughs> really don't even believe in daily practice, you know, like even 20 minutes a day or 10 minutes a day. They said, well, you can be mindful of doing anything. You can be mindful of taking a shower. You can be mindful of making a cup of tea. And what do you think? Uh, and I said, I think hypothetically that's true. And I think in actuality that's a story. You know, for me, it would not be real. Like, I need a daily practice in order to make these things actual, make them, you know, come to life. And Uh um, what do you think about meditation practice uh, without any of this contextualization? When you say contextualization, you mean um, of the, like, the Buddhist teachings? Yeah, or, or you know, an understanding of, um, you know, you and I would call it the Buddhist teachings because that's where we learned it, but... Uh, the truth of impermanence, the truth of yeah. not being in control, and so on. Well, I think that um, there are different options available within our meditation tradition. Mm-hmm. One of the options that's available is called tranquility meditation. And it's often um, compared to or contrasted with insight meditation mm-hmm, practices, mm-hmm. and they do have somewhat different aims. So uh, the the tradition of doing tranquility meditations is a very time-honored one that, you know, you and I have both had a lot of experience mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. and uh, a noble, it's a noble one. Mm-hmm. I actually think that when um, people are entering meditation wanting to do personal healing work, for example, I think classically what they're entering into is the stream of tranquility meditation. Mm-hmm. They want to find some way to settle what feels like an unruly body, mind, heart, emotional field, and the tranquility meditations are designed to do that. It doesn't need a lot of philosophy mm-hmm. to do tranquility meditation. You can take up the practice, get good advice on exactly how to carry it out, mm-hmm and not engage in very much um, philosophizing at all. So I think that's a noble strain. I think that's a worthwhile thing uh, if people want to go that route. What the Buddha pointed to as the greater source of happiness develops out of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So uh, the insight meditation practices, which involve the investigation of three characteristics, are definitely designed to lead to a shift in understanding that needs some contextualization, needs some reflection, and some uh, some conceptual teachings. So I think it's a question of what people want to aim at mm-hmm. and finding the right vehicle to carry them down the path toward their goal. And really, in the end, we... You know, many people will do both. They'll do some of each at yeah. different times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the question about daily life practice versus retreat practice, I think largely depends on somebody's um, resources, um, time, and interest level. But a lot of people get get transformative experiences out of just a daily life practice. Mm-hmm. But just like you, I think the notion of doing it without formal Meditation practice is a hypothetical possibility, but I don't really see it as a true reality for for people in the modern world. Well, for one thing, I think to make that real, you need a, a tremendous amount of intentionality. Mm-hmm. You can't just say, oh, I'm too busy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I've got to get this task done or I've got to, you know, change my air ticket or, you know, forget breathing or whatever, you know. Yeah. And sustaining that level of intentionality moment by moment throughout a busy life is not easy to do. So if you were going to, this may be an impossible question to answer, but if you were going to use a term other than emptiness, uh, do you have another term? Like, so it's not so bleak? Yeah, there are a few different elements to emptiness. I'll just tell a little story. Mm -hmm. Um, the first time I met Mingyur Rinpoche, mm-hmm. we went for a drive up to the top of Mount Tam, and um, I tried to make some small chat with him, and, and he, wasn't, he wasn't into small chat. Mm-hmm. So we got to the top of Mount Tam here in Marin County, and we were walking around a, a narrow path. And so I decided I'd ask him something 
more up his alley. So I said, um, what's the difference between the Madhyamaka view of things and the Dzogchen view? Those are two Buddhist schools in Tibetan Buddhism. Ah, he said, and his eyes lit up. You know, finally I'd gotten onto something that he was interested in. He said, the first thing you have to understand is there are 18 different kinds of emptiness. <laughs> so the word means different things in different contexts. We've been talking about this morning the sense of emptiness of self, mm -hmm. lack of anything fixed in the middle of our experience. Another way to understand it, especially with relation to the events of life or the phenomena of the senses, I would say, is uh, lack of solidity or transparency. So those two, they're pointing to the same thing, but we experience them a little bit differently. So lack of solidity, for instance, you look into the body, which feels like a very heavy mass of stuff, mm -hmm. but the Buddha described it as like a mass of foam. Mm -hmm. And from our both our meditation experiences, we know what it's like to be Con, you know, continuously attending to body sensations and feel them dissolving, you know, as we're as we're experiencing it. So we come to understand the body is actually much lighter than we originally thought it was, mm -hmm. and all the phenomena of the world are like that too. So you kind of put this: there's nothing fixed at the center of us, and the outside is all uh, light and transparent and shifting. And you sort of come to understand, well, really what the experience of life is, is a flowing change. Mm. It never stops anywhere. And the reason we get in trouble is that we want to stop it somewhere. And so you open back up to just this sense life is mm. flowing change, and we can, we can swim mm. in that stream. Mm. That's beautiful. So I'm wondering if you can... Uh lead us in a, a meditation as we close and go off into this stream of change <laughs> and emptiness. Okay. Let's try one. Let's try one that um, brings in uh, a little bit of this element of space. So we'll start in the, in the body, and then we'll see about finding uh, some space within that. And then we'll also see about playing a little bit with the quality of awareness itself. So let's go into some silence and we'll see how, how this feels. So as you're listening uh, now, just find a comfortable position. Probably you're in a posture of sitting where you feel relaxed and at ease and also maybe a little upright so you bring in a sense of some energy. You can let your eyes gently close. Just settle into the feeling of what it feels like to be sitting in this body, with this body, in this moment. And as you're settling into the experience of the body, you might notice within the different sensations that are going on, some sensations connected with breathing. So you might feel how an in-breath comes in through the nostrils, expands the chest, makes the belly rise, and how on the out-breath those reverse. The belly falls, the chest falls, breath goes out. And so pick the part of the breath where the sensations are clearest for you. Could be at the nose, could be in the chest, could be in the belly. And bring your attention to those sensations. You might just be feeling the air going in and out through the nose. You might be feeling the chest or belly rise and fall. And as you're with those sensations of breathing, notice how they're changing with each breath. Something happens on the in-breath, something happens on the out-breath.
And none of the sensations last very long. Changing breath by breath. So here already we're getting a sense of the impermanent nature of the sense door of the body, the sense of sensations. Now, because the body extends from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, it does define some element, some feeling of space in our direct experience of the moment. So get a sense of how big that space is from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet, the extent of the body. So as you connect with the space defined by the body, is every bit of that space taken up with sensations? Or are there kind of sensations here, sensations there, and then some areas of just open space throughout the body? Can you get a sense of space around the sensations of the breath, for example? So with a little bit of a sense of the space in the body, the space around the sensations of breathing, is that the same space or different space than the space that's all around you as you sit? Can you feel how there's kind of one space and the body's in part of it and space is also throughout the body in your experience? And then that you're aware of the breath, you're aware of the body, and you're aware of the space. Is the awareness as wide as the space? Let the awareness be as wide as the space. And then just rest in that. Feeling the sense of how the awareness and the space hold all the elements of our experience without any problem or conflict. Just rest there. And when you're ready, come out and we'll end the meditation. Thank you so much. Okay, that was it. I feel so different. (laughs) (laughs) And thank you for being with me today. Oh, Sharon, it was such a treat. It was so great. Be able to sit down and talk Dharma together. We should do it more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have more, have more podcasts. Yeah, or just be in the same room. It would be great. <laughs> that would be even. Or better. both at the same time. Yeah, yeah. To learn more about Guy's work and teachings, you cannot visit his website because he doesn't have one, <laughs> which is so amusing, <laughs> really. Um, but you can visit the website for the Insight Meditation Society for his teaching schedule there. So that's www.dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A dot org slash teacher slash guy dash Armstrong. (laughs) Got all those slashes and dashes. Uh, And his book, Emptiness, A Practical Guide for Meditators, is available right now in hardcover, paperback, and ebook form, and I highly recommend it. Thank you so much. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.